Good morning, everybody. My name is Rosie Emery, and I am, I have been in my life, a children's entertainer, songwriter, singer, and right now I work for WGCU Public Media in Fort Myers, which is PBS for Southwest Florida, and I produce, write, direct, create their Curious Kids children's television <laughs> half-hour program, as well as doing video docu documentaries for the CHNEP, and currently working on their Citizens uh, Academy videos, so some of you I've met from doing interviews with you. Um, but just to give you a little bit of background on me, because that's why this is relevant when talking about today is how multimedia can enhance environmental education. I'd like to say right from the get-go that if I had my druthers, I'd be taking every kid out into a swamp, out into the estuary, out onto the mountain, hiking, doing all that. And I have done that. And often people way back when I started doing the programs that I do, which is about 20 years ago, and developing web-based programs or television programs, they'd say, oh, but that's no good, that's just going to get them on screen time and blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, but you know what? They're going to be on that screen time anyway. So let's develop content that's interesting to them, content that engages them, that inspires them. And having traveled, you know, for many, many years across countries, across Canada, across the United States, singing in schools and giving programs, I know that there are many ways of engaging kids. And we need to use everything we can to engage them, to get them fascinated. I was really lucky as a child. I grew up in a magical place called Sherwood Forest, where a guy called Robin Hood used to live. So my playground was a forest filled with trees, and I was lucky enough to be homeschooled, and my teacher, well, I wasn't homeschooled, I had a governess with a bunch of girls, and our teacher began every day with National Geographic. She would open a National Geographic, and she would say, where should we go today? And across the world we went, or out into our backyard we went, and we discovered, we engaged, we were curious about everything. And if I had a school, that's how I would start my day, every day, with National Geographic. We did math through that. We did history. We learned about cultures and languages and art and music, all those things. But, you know, this is the way of it. We are where we are. So I do what I can, and I do develop programs because um, that are multimedia. And I've found from developing these programs that they have their place because children do respond to animation, they do respond to videos, and so these things have a part. That's how we can um, use these tools, and especially today with all the social media, which, you know, when I see people going on Pinterest and Tumblr, I think, oh, goodness gracious, I've got to get to that too. I haven't done it yet. But there are just so many platforms that we can engage in, and that children are growing up. This is their world. This is what they do, this is where they are, and we can encourage them to get outside and explore from those platforms too. We can say, hey, look at this, why don't you go and check it out? There's lots of great ideas and things that you can do. So, I'm going to start off by telling you a story, and this story is a story that I used for many, many years in my programs, and it's a Muskogee Creek story, and it's called How Grandmother Spider Stole the Sun, and this is the way it goes. Once upon a time, a long time ago, the earth was very dark. Nobody could get anything done. Everybody was bumping into everybody else. And so one day, all the creatures came together, and they had a meeting. I have heard, said Bear, there is something called the sun. It is kept on the other side of the world. But the people there do not want to share it. I think we should go and take a piece of the sun and bring it back to give light to all the creatures and all the people. But who is going to be the first to go? Well, Fox said he would go. And so Fox ran to the other side of the world. He crept up to where the sun was and he grabbed a piece of it in his mouth. Ow! And he turned and ran to bring the sun back to all the creatures and all the people. But the sun was very hot and it burned all the inside of Fox's mouth. So he dropped it. But to this day, all foxes have black mouths inside because that first fox burned his, trying to take a piece of the sun. So who is going to be the next to go? 
Well, it was Possum. But in those days, Possum had a very nice bushy tail. She ran to the other side of the world, she took a piece of the sun, and she hid it under her nice bushy tail. And then she turned and ran to bring the sun back to all the creatures and all the people. But the sun was very hot and it burned all the hair off Possum's tail. And to this day, all possums have bare naked tails because that first possum burned hers trying to take a piece of the sun. So who is going to be the next to go? Well, it was Grandmother Spider. But she was smart. She was wise. She crawled to the other side of the world. She wove a bag out of her webbing. She took a piece of the sun and she put it in her bag of webbing. And then she came back to bring the sun to all the creatures and all the people. But now, how are they going to get it into the sky? They had to ask a bird. And the only bird that happened to come by was a big bird called Buzzard. No problem, said Buzzard. I can take the sun to the top of the sky. And so Buzzard put the bag of Grandmother Spider's Wowie on top of his head with the sun inside. And he began to fly up and up and up into the sky. But as he flew, the sun grew hotter and hotter, began to burn through the bag, began to burn the feathers on top of his head, and still Buzzard flew up. He had told everyone he could reach the top of the sky. And finally, he did reach the top of the sky. But the skin on top of his head had been burned. It was all red. And to this day, all Buzzards have red heads. They have skin on top of their head is red. But he placed the sun there. And sometimes at night, when you look at the night sky, can you put your fingers together like this? Put your fingers together. And you look at the sky, and sometimes you see clouds across the sky. And they look like the lines in Grandmother Spider's web. And they remind us that everything in the world is connected in some way or another. And they also remind us what Grandmother Spider and all the other creatures did. And that's the story. So next time you see a spider, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, one, of, one of the things that I've sort of, as you, you know, interconnected has been my theme. But it's interesting, I started touring schools 20, about 22 years ago now. And so on the odd occasion, of course, now faced with YouTube and all these things, I hear back from kids. And I must have heard at least 10 times with kids that I've run into who are now grown up. Oh, I remember that story of Grandmother Spider. It connected. We were all connected, right? It was that connected thing, you know? <laughs> and I say, that's right. We're all interconnected. And I think it's, you know, it was, a, it, to me, it was always that an image, a story, a song, something can remain with us and remind us all our lives of one little thing that we hear like that. So, of course, my theme has been how we're all interconnected. Now, this is the place where I would normally put the music on. But I think, because I can't get the music, I think what I'm going to do is just get you snapping your fingers. Because you can all see the words, and that way we're going to sing it. Because, you know, we can all just sit here the whole time, but I think we should have a little bit of music. Since I'm a musician, I didn't bring my guitar, but we can... Can you all snap your hands? Okay, there you go. So that's one part of it. The other part is the actions. We go like this. We're all interconnected. The earth and the sun and the moon. Yes, we're all interconnected. And we'll find out very soon that if we mess with one, then we mess with the whole. And soon there'll be nothing to mess with at all. We better make a move. So I'm going to sing it a cappella. And <coughs> we're going to get it going. Oh. With the, um, I'll sing it here because then I can do the actions. Okay, we're gonna get it go with the the rhythm goes. So here we go. Here we go. One, two, one, two, three. Well, we're all interconnected. The earth and the sun and the moon. Yes, we're all interconnected, and we'll find out very soon that if we mess with one, then we mess with the whole. And soon there'll be nothing to mess with at all, because we're all interconnected. OK, I want to hear you. We better make a move. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right, well, this group may get the A-plus for movement. <laughs>
<laughs> Very good, okay. You guys, in the, the ones on the side, you need a little uh, more coffee, maybe. <laughs> so, after touring uh, schools, and I haven't got a watch on me, so you'll have to tell me what I'm on time. After touring schools, for many years doing the Rainbow Road Tour, which was a tour which taught kids and connected kids across Canada and the northern United States, teaching them about how all of life is interconnected. Uh, that was very much a live show. I would do live programs and then I would do presentations afterwards, two a day for five years. You can imagine what that was like. Anyway, <laughs> I came down here and started working with WGCU Public Media in Fort Myers. Uh, anybody member of WGCU here? Got any members? Oh, yay! Public television, great resource. And um, through the years, I've been developing different ideas. First of all, we worked with the Charlotte Harbor National Estuary Program. We developed a website, which was the Curious Kids Nature Club. And then we went on to do other different programs, always trying to find funding, of course. And then we decided to do the Curious Kids television show. And... Um, so we created the Curious Kids television show, and what's been great about this TV show, for me, I think, is that it's really connected children with Southwest Florida. It's allowed me, a friend of mine used to always say, you have to come in the back door <laughs> with the environment. I don't know why, but anyway. So even if I'm doing a show on, um, we have different themes. So if it's a show on cooperation, then we'll, we, I still get in things like what volunteers are doing in the Gulf or what you know, different people are doing at Crow, for example. We did, I think Rachel's here, yay! We did one version, one uh, segment out at Crow. So we always manage to get out into the community here and reach out to different organizations that are helping not only with the environment but with the community. And one of the things that's nice about multimedia is that you can combine it with going outdoors. Again, I can't get... My PowerPoint, I, I use a Mac. Okay, I'm a Mac person. And I couldn't get the Mac to the PC, but <laughs> you can go to the website. I can give it you afterwards. So, for example, we did a section on bats. And so bats, as many of you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, are very important to the environment. But a lot of people don't know this. Um, and I'm going to talk about that again in a minute. And that's the value of nature, looking at how we talk about nature and the environment. And I've been... Uh, working in environmental education now for a long time, and I've watched it go through many different changes and, and sort of, it's, at, sometimes it's really popular and other times it's like nobody wants to talk about it. And It can be very frustrating if you're an educator and trying to get into a school system or trying to get funding for something because nobody seems to care. And just lately, I've been reading, um, oh, well, I'll tell you that in a minute, hang on. The importance of that. So you've got the you can watch the video, you can go outside at night with the kids and look for bats because like in the early evening they're coming out, especially down the beach we see a lot of them. And then you've got a song, which I won't make you sing. <laughs> Although it's fun, <laughs> we can sing it. So you've got three different components there. You can watch a video about it, you can go outside, talk about the importance of bats, you can learn a song. So there's three different components. There's the song, but we I'm not going to sing it, so. <laughs> Whoops, okay. Mosquito, there's another one. I was sitting next to Miss Mosquito Control Lady over there. All right, so another one that it's, it's great to talk about it, to go outside and learn about it, but it's also great to sing a song about it. And this happens to be quite a fun song. You kind of look totally ridiculous. You leap around. <laughs> but it makes it fun for kids. And, again, the importance of movement. If you are working with kids, it's really important to get them moving because, you know, there's not too much gym these days. Okay, this is a book I've just been reading lately. It's called uh, What Has Nature Ever Done For Us? And the guy is called Tony Juniper. And I heard him first on NPR. Thank goodness for NPR. And um, I was just blown away by him because he had so many good examples um, of how nature, the value of nature, looking at the value of nature. And so that has really become a real focal point for me now is, is really connecting the dots. And he tells this great story of the decline of vultures in India. And these are just some of the numbers from 97 to 2007. Vultures in India declined an average of 97%. And the cause was the anti-inflammatory drug diclofenac, which was used on livestock. And the vultures eating the dead livestock 
which were lying around, they were poisoned by it. So the consequences of that were all these bodies of livestock were left out in the sun. The poor people who normally would collect the bones, who would use parts, they would use the skin or different parts left, they couldn't make money anymore. And then, of course, it was a breeding ground for bacteria. And the other thing that happened was the rise in rats and dogs. The feral dog population rose by 7 million, causing a rise in dog bites and infections. So researchers estimated between 92 and 2003, the years tracked, 50,000 people estimated to have died from rabies. The estimated impact on India's economy from the loss of one, that one population was $34 billion. So, you know, when you start to think of the impact of nature, of course here, if we think about the wetlands and the, important of the, the importance of the watershed, so I start to talk to kids about that in any way that I can, to say, well, what would we do if we didn't have this wetland? I mean, we've just seen what's happened with Lake Okeechobee. Um, you know, we just did an interview with Ray Ann Wessel and on Franklin Lock talking about what would happen before this happened. And now, of course, we're seeing the economic impact with people cancelling their vacations because they don't want to come somewhere with muddy water. And so when you look at the economic value of these things, then um, it starts to make sense to people. So again, with, with Curious Kids, we've looked at biomimicry. We've looked at, um, we did a STEAM show just recently, um, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, <laughs> because we want to include the arts. And, you know, it was, the kids were really fascinated by that. One of the shows we did is the Eco Footprint Show, and if anybody wants one of the shows, I do have some DVDs to give away. And in the Eco Footprint Show, we had the Footprint Song, of course, looking at uh, the way that we impact the earth. We also had a segment on worm composting with a worm song. I'm a wriggly, wiggly worm. You've got to have the song in there. Even easy songs. It doesn't have to be very difficult. It gets people moving. It's funny. Everybody's laughing. They remember. One of the things when I was on tour that always impacted me was we'd have the principal up dancing rock and roll with the secretary. And there was a kid who left a message on, on YouTube just recently. It wasn't very polite, a lot of it, but it did say that it was the best day ever when I went to the school and they had the concert because so-and-so was dancing with Mr. So-and-so or whatever. <laughs> but they remember that all those years later. I hope they remember that we're all interconnected. So we do things like um, the eco footprint. Bees, again, the value of bees. Bees aren't always easy to get close to, and again, lots of people get scared of bees because of you know, the, the, there are the Africanized bees that are around. Some of our kids went actually to uh, meet Keith Council, who's a beekeeper, and so they learned about bees. And the food security value again, what is the value to us of bees? I mean, insects, biodiversity, keeping native plants around. You know, all these insects, the so many beneficial insects. Without them, just take one of those species out and everything else. So talking about this, connecting with this. The bee song, of course. <laughs> Sorry. Um, bee song, so we had the bee song, yeah. Value importance of wetlands and watershed. This segment was actually sponsored by CHNEP. We've got Kate and Ned Sir there. And actually what you can't see there is they've caught a Dobson fly larva. And it's this really sort of alien looking creature, quite large, you know, about the size of my hand. It turns into this huge fly, which is just incredible. I mean, the kids were just fascinated by that. So we, again, keystone species, another thing that we look at um, on the show, the alligator, just that one species, how it affects so many aspects of the landscape here. Um, one of the things that I use in education, or I think about a lot, is multiple intelli intelligence learning, um, the fact that we all learn in different ways. And that's one of the nice things about multimedia, because some people are very visual. They learn much better from watching something. Some people learn from singing or from music. Or some people are nature spot. Kids, a lot of kids are nature spot. They're very connected to nature if we give them that chance. Another project that I worked on and developed was something called the Little Earth Charter. I have a couple of DVDs of that here. Um, and the Little Earth Charter, which I don't think I can show you because we haven't got sound. Um, but it's basically, we worked in consultation with the Earth Charter Initiative. Anybody know of the Earth Charter Initiative? Okay. So we worked in consultation with them to develop something 
uh, for children because the Earth Charter, the original Earth Charter, has uh, 18 principles, I believe, I've forgotten now, and they're all quite complex. And so we wanted to create something that was very simple for children. And to date, this has been purchased by the government of Sweden, so it's in every single school in Sweden, the government of Manitoba, Canada, it's in every single school in Manitoba, and so the kids grow up from very young learning how everything is connected and how we are all partly, we are all responsible, we all have a responsibility. Another thing that we developed was something called the footprint game, again talking about our footprint, it's animation, it's a game, it's fun, kids enjoy doing it, got lots of crazy sounds, and, but they're learning as they go along, that if I use, you know, if I have a bath, this is, this is this much water. If I have a shower, maybe it's a bit less. How long are you in the shower for? I always used to ask kids in school. Oh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it takes me so long. And how long would it take you to carry that water if you had to go and get that water? You know, when you go to countries, I remember being in Mexico one time, way up in the mountains, and half the kids in the school that I was talking to went to school in the morning and half in the afternoon. And the kids that weren't at school, they were carrying water backwards and forwards. So, you know, we don't think about it, we just turn on a tap, it's very easy. Okay, I'm a musician, so I do write songs, and I have found that, you know, I've really spent my career creating songs about animals and nature, and I found that it is a way to teach about the environment. So one song, for example, on this CD, I saw butterflies kissing today, you've got all these different animals in the song that you can talk about, and then you can go out into the backyard and look for them. So it's a combination, it's not just one thing or the other. Again, it's always with the goal of getting outside, and um, that's it. I also created a book which has hand actions and music. So these are sort of the things that I've done for multimedia. So those are my programs at the moment. It's the Curious Kids TV show, The Little Earth Charter, and me. <laughs> <laughs> so am I all right on time? So any questions? Yes. Who is Whiskey Jeff? Whiskey Jack is like a blue jay. Oh. But it's a Canadian, it's actually, it's, it's the scrub jay that's out west. It's the western version of the blue jay. I know, it grows so well in the song, the Whiskey Jack. Yeah, yeah. How did you get your program into the schools? Ah, the question was, how did I get the program into the schools? Well, when I originally started, which was like in 1997, um, when I did the Rainbow Road Tour, I partnered with partnerships. I partnered with the World Wildlife Fund in Canada, and they sent um, my flyer out to all their schools. That was like 150,000. But it, just to give you an example of how hard it is, out of 150,000 people, I offered a concert, a rock concert, for the whole school, plus two workshops, and it was free. And I only got like 110 booked. <laughs> You know, it's, it's, always, it's always a challenge, so there are no easy answers for it. Unfortunately, like I said, environmental education seems to be one of those things that fluctuates, which is why I think, you know, the more we include it in STEM or including it in economy, economics, I mean, there's so many different angles. So it's just trying to be creative. That's what happened with me. I mean, for five years I taught, but in the end, schools gave donations and we kept it going. Yeah. But it's not easy. <laughs> Persistence. Any other questions? Yes. How do we get one of your CDs? Oh, well, I have some here. Otherwise, they're online through all the. You just have to Google Rosie Emery and they're online. But I do have some here. Will you be yeah. here for the day? I will be here for the day, yes. And I have, um, if you want one of the DVDs, I have about 10 DVDs of the Eco Footprint Show. But it is on YouTube. So you can see it at the Curious Kids YouTube channel. Yes, there's a question down there. Well, multiple intelligence learning, so body smart is some people are really good at dancing, or they're really good, they're really connected, they're good at gymnastics, they're good at sports. They, they learn very well in a sort of physical environment. Some kids are better, they learn through nature, they learn better outside. Some kids learn better from visual, you know, from seeing video or from listening. We learn in different ways, and the more we learn about that's one of the things, actually, that the arts, there really, there's a lot of research now going on how the arts does help us to learn, how music helps us 
to learn. In the same way as, you know, Last Child in the Woods helped the research to get started really on how children are affected by being outdoors. It's so important. So that's, it's um, Howard Gardner was the person who sort of came up with the concept of multiple intelligence. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you, Rosie.